faster than a speeding bullet. More powerful than a locomotive. Able to leap tall buildings at a single bound. Look, up in the sky, it's a bird. It's a plane. It's House of Ed Tech, episode 68. Hi, this is Jennifer Cronk, Google Education Trainer and Google Certified Teacher, and you are listening to the House of Ed Tech with Chris Nessie. This episode of the House of Ed Tech is brought to you by SummerPD.com. Are you a passionate educator looking to engage and empower your students with the help of technology? Does traditional PD leave you underwhelmed? Then you need to check out SummerPD.com, which is a 10-week at-your-own-pace program that explores educational technologies like Google Classroom, apps, and formative assessments. You can save $10 by using the promo code House of Ed Tech when you make your purchase and gain 24-7 access to some great PD courses. And it doesn't matter that summer is, summer is almost over. It's okay. Just go to summerpd.com and sign up today. Welcome to the House of Ed Tech podcast. I am your host, Christopher Nessie. And the House of Ed Tech explores how technology is changing the way teachers teach and the impact that technology is having in education. My objectives include discussing technology that is changing our classrooms and schools and sharing tools and tips that you can hear about today and use tomorrow. I talk to teachers, leaders, and creators just like you and have them share their stories. The purpose? Whether you use it or not, technology is changing the way we teach and how our students learn. And welcome back inside another episode of the House of EdTech podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm so glad that you are taking time out of your busy life and your schedule to get some awesome PD and learn about some EdTech on the go. So good morning, good evening, happy generic time of the day. In this episode, it's going to be a lot of fun because, of course, I have an EdTech thought. I have an EdTech recommendation We've got the House of EdTech VIP, and my special guest today, well, not my special guest, uh, she's special, uh, Stacey Lindis is my guest and my co-host, and beyond that, she is actually here in the House of EdTech. Good generic time of the day, Stacey. So what do you think? It's pretty cool being in the House of EdTech. I've already taken pictures. I'm getting ideas. Wondering what podcasting could look like. This is a completely different side, much more complicated than uh, what I did with my students last year. So this is kind of exciting. There's a lot of exciting coming up for you. Yeah, big move. Going to middle school next year. I get to graduate. I keep graduating. <laughs> now you're in the same district, so you're still in West Windsor Plains Borough, and yep. you're moving from the the four or five building to a what, what grades are in middle school for Traditional, you? Traditional six, seven, eight. Six, seven, eight. And it's literally across the street. So all my four or five friends, I get to visit them um, for lunch, whatever. And um, what's really nice is I'll move up with a lot of the kids that I've been with for the last two years. And when I taught first grade, this was the last group that I actually worked with. They're now sixth and seventh graders. So I'll see some of them since I only taught about 23 of them. Um, if you're not familiar with Stacy, she has been on the podcast previously. She appeared... On episode 30, which you can find at chrisnessy.com slash 30, and she talked about one-to-one -one technology integration, which, and I know I've told you this before, it is my most popular and most downloaded episode. I still don't believe that, but... Um, well, before you leave the House of EdTech today, I will show you the actual stats. Okay, and I'll take pictures. Okay. <laughs> and she was also on episode 59 with our good friend AJ Bianco, where they took over the podcast and I was the guest. And you can find that at chrisnessy.com slash 59. Stacy, I have a little bit of feedback to do and okay. that's fun. So I got a couple of new iTunes reviews. James from Ohio said that I am a tech lifeline. So I appreciate that, James. And thank you for taking time to leave an iTunes review. And podbuzz.com, that's P-O-D-B-U-Z-Z-Z.com, said that this is a great show for teachers and that I provide helpful and informative advice and tips to the best ways of incorporating technology into modern day teaching. And they also said that my show is well produced and entertaining. Would you say it's entertaining, Stacey? 
Yeah, definitely. And I think it's all of those things, a lifeline. You were the first educational podcast that I listened to. I think I told you that. Yes. Um, and prior to that, I was just listening to whatever nonsense I was totally interested in. And as you say, there's a podcast about everything and for everyone, including duct tape wallets, which we looked up. <laughs> yes, it's out there. And it's out there. And uh, yeah, so... I, I I didn't know there were educational podcasts, so you were my introduction, and from there I found others. But it's been it's been great listening to you and watching you grow, and uh, yeah, learn with you. We've been learning together, and I've watched you grow too since we've met. So, <laughs> um, so there were no questions this week. But if you who are listening, if you have an edtech question or something you'd like me to answer or address or talk about, uh, send a tweet. Use the hashtag House of EdTech. You can Vox me. I'm on Voxer, of course, Mr. Nessie, M-R-N-E-S-I. Or you can call the old House of EdTech hotline at 732-903-4869. And actually, a new feature, if you haven't discovered it yet, if you visit my website, chrisnessie.com, on your mobile phone, so Android or iOS, you'll actually be initially prompted to share some feedback, and there's a call now button on the phone. So I'm trying to make it easy for you to get in touch with me. So check that out and leave me a voicemail and maybe I'll play it on the show. Who am I kidding? I will definitely play it on the show. Uh, and for my awesome supporters, Peggy George, Mark Grindel, Dan Gallagher, and Jeff Herb, thank you so much for being awesome supporters. And if you would like to be an awesome supporter, just go to chrisnessy.com slash awesome and you can learn how you can support the show in a different way. And now, the EdTech Thought. This episode's EdTech Thought, I'm going to keep with the, tra not the tradition, but the theme that we talked about in the last episode with Derek Larson. And Derek and I talked about transitioning out of the classroom and into his new role as director of Southeast Technology in the state of Utah. And it's a very exciting opportunity for Jeff. Derek. Jeff. For Derek. Yeah, for Derek. <laughs> yeah, that other guy. Yeah, it, it's been a long day already. <laughs> and I'm not going to edit that out, so live with my mistakes, everybody. <laughs> um, but keeping with the theme of transition, Stacey, we, we just touched on it a little bit in the opening. You're going to be transitioning from elementary school ed tech into middle school. So not so much an interview, but I want to know, what are you excited about? as you make this transition into six, seven, eight with working with older kids. And you already touched on that. You'll see some students that you've already taught, but what are you looking forward to in this position? I'm looking forward to seeing the potential. You know, I, my last classroom experience was first grade. Like I said, I'll see some of those kids as they enter sixth and seventh. Um, and, and we did a lot of great things when I was a first grade teacher and also when I was a third grade teacher. So I'm, I'm used to that transition, but this for me is a completely different beast. I never taught any of those upper, upper level grades. Middle school is completely new. Um, but I'm really excited to see how much more they're capable of doing. Having witnessed it from third to first, the difference and, you know, raising the bar for first graders. I think a lot of people are naive and I know you um, spoke with, I can picture her face and Stephanie Hessline. Thank you. And she was talking about all of the things that she, that she did with her first graders and she moved from fifth to first, right? I think third to first. Third to first. So, I mean, that's a big jump. I did that. I thought it was fifth. I thought she had a bigger gap, but, um, you think that they're not capable of quite as much. And, you know, just listening to her conversation. And when I was in the classroom, a lot of that wasn't happening at, as, as a, you know, as readily as it is now. But um, I'm looking to see how the kids that I've worked with for the past two years in fourth and fifth grade are now able to take the skills that they've learned from their teachers and from themselves and their own exploration and really transcend and work beyond the potential that their teachers think they might have, the potential that they think they might have, their own limits, and just, you know, the new opportunities that are out there. I'm, I'm really excited just to see how far they can go. Now, with that, I, I know, and this is from conversations that we've had on, on Voxer and different things, that there were some 
websites and services that you would have wanted to use that were not, say, COPA compliant, do you think you'll have much, many more opportunities having this older group of students and working with kids who are older? Not really. Only because, you know, COPA is that 13 age group. And in our district, we just don't even turn it on until, middle, until high school. So that even though we might have 13-year-olds at the middle school level, there's no point trying to figure out which eighth graders meet the age requirement. So Okay, that, that, that does... That does make sense. You don't want to be weeding through the class rosters and okay. Hey, my bad. I... <laughs> no, I mean, it's a great question. It's a solid question, you know, and you and I've also had this conversation, just how, how scared some people can be and how limiting we can get. So, um, you know, we don't have, um, Google communities on for our, our younger group totally makes sense. It's against the law. But then there are other things that we block that I think is a little frustrating. And I know a lot of it has to do with growing pains and kids this age, right? Middle schoolers. And it, and, and it is very specifically with our middle schoolers. Uh, we've blocked Google Hangouts, which for me is a shame because it's a really great way for kids to communicate both academically and not academically. And, you know, sometimes- which is part of middle school is growing academically and socially. And I, I can see. Right. But when kids choose to abuse that privilege, then those privileges get taken away. But what's really sad is that it's taken away for everybody. Well, look at it this way. If they're going to abuse it, it's on their own time. And well, they're on their own now. Who's going to teach them? My thing is, if they're going to abuse it and they really feel that they need that, that outlet, they're going to find a way. And of course. we've now taken away the level of safety and the level of um, Big Brother, which, you know, it's not necessarily a good well, there's thing, no, but the ability to monitor what they're doing. And there's no digital citizenship component. Right. Which, but we're working on that. So right. that's, you know, that's part of the work that, um, you, and, you know, if you go back to episode 30, um, you'll, you'll know that I'm part of a six-person team. And um, since then, my... My, um, one of my teammates has become my supervisor. So, you know, we're a pretty well oiled machine. We're getting, a, we're, we're adding someone new to the team. One of our colleagues moved up. She'll be with you next year, um, as a supervisor of technology, ed- educational technology. In Shout out to Melissa, who is now in New Brunswick. Congratulations, Melissa. I hope you're having fun. Um, but we're excited. You know, we have Jessica coming on. She comes with some really great high school experience and Kim rounds out that upper level experience and the rest of us are really elementary teachers, but we know the importance of giving kids the safety nets. And so what we've done is we've come up with some curriculum and some lessons for teachers, all teachers um, in sixth, seventh and eighth grade to teach within the first month of school to help bridge that gap from four or five and whatever they may not have gotten, um, in previous years. So, you know, we'll talk about digital citizenship, your online footprint, tattoo, whatever you want to call it, whatever's permanent fingerprint. I think fingerprint is really the word that a lot of people are switching to just because footprints go away and, um, (laughs) tattoos can be removed. This was a big debate. (laughs) We talk about silly things too, but you know, we just want to make sure that people know that, you know, yeah, you can take a tweet down, you can take down, you know, something that's mean and malicious. But if someone saw it, it's not gone forever. And if someone screenshotted it, you're really in trouble then. Um, and we've had some of that. And, you know, we've had some cyberbullying. And I think that that's part of, part of education is, you know, being that safety net for kids so that they can that they can learn to grow in a place where they can make mistakes, but they're not falling to the ground and, you know, at their peril. Absolutely. Uh, something you had touched on in, in what you were saying, you mentioned the word fear. So Derek talked about missing the kids that he taught and looking forward to working with some families again that have like, maybe it's a third or fourth child in, in the series. Um, what are you scared of and what are you going to miss from elementary now. So, so it's, it's, so it's two parts. What are you afraid of and what are you going to miss? So let's start with what I'm going to miss. Um, you know, 
like I said, I, I'm not new to change. I've taught second, third, and then first. That's, you know, those are my classroom experiences. So that kind of change is not foreign to me. And then, you know, leaving the classroom five years ago, this will be my fifth year out of the classroom. Um, I get that. Um, I, I, you miss the people that you work with every day. They become your second family. You spend more time with those people and those kids than you do with your own family in reality. Um, but I've learned that you can make friends with anyone. And if your friends that you've made along the way are true friends, then you'll, you'll stay in touch. So I'm really excited that I have that opportunity to grow myself, um, but while still holding on to some of those friendships I've made and the, the connections that I've fostered throughout the years. My fear is, uh, is self-admittedly my, my lack of knowledge about middle school. So I'll be doing a lot of learning with them. When you say lack of knowledge about middle school, it's not a lack of knowledge about tech because you know tech, you know education. Is it just the age group that you're uncomfortable with a little bit? Um, it's... Yes and no. I mean, you hear about the age group and I think that, you know, kids are kids. Their problems get bigger as they do. Um, but I, I, it's, it's the experience, like the actual teaching experience where I recognize my limitation, right? My last classroom experience was with six and seven year olds. My next assignment isn't necessarily to be with those kids, but if I'm going to work with them, if I'm going to work with their teachers on how to provide sound instruction, then I need to know more about what the middle school classroom looks like. Um, I never worked in a teaming situation where I taught one subject all day long. And what does that look like? You know, the kids rotate. They're very independent. What does that look like? When they talk about flipping the classroom, yeah, I know about that, but I've never actually seen it, you know, firsthand. Um, limited, limited flipped um, math classrooms at the four or five level, but those are teachers who, you know, are in that particular situation on the cutting edge, you know, like no one else is flipping their math class. And, you know, as we move to math workshop, a lot of it is changing, but then that's math workshop at the elementary level. What does math look like? at the middle school and then where does tech fit into math? That's always, I feel like the biggest beast um, when it comes to ed tech is how do you fit that into the math classroom? And since we are one-to-one and next year I will be working with an entire school that is one-to-one as opposed to just one grade level, I'll have three grade levels. That's going to be another challenge, but I'm really excited. I mean, the kids who are moving up to eighth grade have now had their computers with them or a device that's been their own since sixth grade, some of them since fifth grade, if they were part of that pilot. So they're very knowledgeable. I think for their teachers, and I'm anticipating this I'm, and I'm projecting, which might be unfair, but there might be some fear on their part in that their kids will be three years ahead of them. That's true. And, and we've talked about that. You know, How do you best support these eighth grade teachers who may be having some kids who are technology gurus and high flyers? And it's tricky because, you know, on the one hand, you don't, the kids will never suffer, right? They will find their own education. You know, we talk about YouTube and YouTube being the new classroom. And, you know, if you have a question, where do you go? And, and the kids know that. Um, I don't know. It's, it, it'll be interesting having three grade levels. And, you know, do we work with the sixth and seventh grade teachers trying to elevate them so that, you know, the, you know, treading the water and dipping their toes in that they got to do for their, their first, you know, one or two years, do we bring it up so that they're able to really swim and, you know, make those kids that much stronger? Um, or do we focus all of our energy on eighth grade so that those kids, those teachers don't feel that they're at a disadvantage because their kids know so much. Now, when you talk about that, that fear about, the age group and, and those grade levels, what are you doing or what, what's in your plan to overcome that challenge? You know, I, my last middle school experience was when I was in middle school and <laughs> I was able to spend some time at the end of the school year observing a project that our entire district does, which is, um, 
Oh, Mark, I'm sorry. The global challenge, right? So the kids work independently for four days to try to solve one of the great problems of the world, whether it's um, scarcity of water, you know, creating innovation, uh, women's issues, a lot of the things that you would see in Model UN, they're tackling independently in eighth grade with no teacher intervention. Teachers are there to supervise, but they work for four days um, during their content area time, which isn't really what's going to happen for the other 176 days of the school year when their teachers are, you know, giving them direct instruction or they're facilitating conversation um, and, and thinking and learning. So for me, that was a nice experience to see the age group and to see what they're capable of doing and how they're, they're, you know, capable of working independently and the growth that they've made. Um, but I think come September, my plan is to go into the classrooms and just kind of observe, you know, I'm hoping that I can find a couple of people who are willing to let me shadow, you know, shadow a kid essentially so that I go and I don't want to pick on one kid, but if I could, you know, follow a block's schedule, you know, so if I follow team, um, you know, the team, um, G it's Grover, we have team T G M S. So Thomas, Thomas Grover middle school. Um, if I follow the, the G team, then, you know, I start with their first period and then I move to their second period and I might not follow them through their cycle classes or to lunch, but just to get a sense of what it looks like in the classroom. Make sure you eat. Okay. Make well, sure you go to lunch. I, I, there's no lack of me eating. Don't worry about it. No fear. No fears there. <laughs> no fears there. <laughs> so ultimately, will you be successful? Absolutely. Thank you. I'm nervous, but I, I, I think it'll be okay. A little, little bit of fear makes you stronger. Makes you rise. Absolutely. And for this episode's EdTech recommendation, I just learned about this recently. It's called Answer Garden, and you can find it at answergarden.ch. It's not in China, I don't think, but it's .ch. Answer Garden is a minimalistic feedback tool. It allows you to plant a question and invite participants to your answer garden. Their answers will instantly form a growing word cloud. You can use Answer Garden for real-time audience participation, online brainstorming, and even classroom feedback. Answer Garden has many different users, classrooms, conference and corporate audiences, creative teams, online crowds, mind mappers, and more. Answer Garden fits educational, professional, and creative purposes, is standalone as well as embeddable, and it shows thousands of answers in a glance. A great education application of Answer Garden would be to have students potentially choose their own adventure in your class about the topics you might discuss. So, for example, if I'm doing a lesson about the Civil War, I might have them choose between a couple of battles that maybe we'll talk about a battle today. And I can use this to have them type in the name of the battle or the date. And then I can see this word cloud grow and know where a majority of their interest lies. And that can help me tailor my lesson on the fly. So check out Answer Garden again at answergarden.ch. And if you use it or have a different way that you can use it in your classroom, please leave a comment on the show notes, chrisnessy.com slash 68 or tweet Vox, all those good ways. Check out Answer Garden. And of course, we're still here with Stacy Lindis. And the reason that I brought Stacy on is because she is, and we'll get right to the point, she is a sketch noting guru. I so, am not a guru, but thanks. You are a guru because I'm looking at a couple of books here that you've brought, some notebooks. You have your, for lack of a better term, your pencil case. <laughs> There's no better term. It's a pencil case. It's a pencil case. Um, so first, Stacy, for the listener who doesn't know, what is sketch noting? So sketch noting comprises images, drawings, typography, 
color, shape, and it puts it all together so that the information you take in goes down on paper or in your tablet um, and makes meaning for you. So it's a 21st century way of taking notes. And it is very visually appealing because... I love your drawings. You did. I don't want to get ahead of us, but you did a massive hundred day project where for 100 days you sketch noted every day. And I believe you chose to do some different Ted talks and other ways. So you were learning and drawing. And it, it, if I didn't know the English language, it's just a beautiful project of art because in essence it is art. So you've created a great project, Thanks. Um, but you also learned a lot too. I don't know where I was going with that, but. Oh, I know <laughs> <laughs> the, the beauty of lot li- of sort of live. Um, so my next question, how did you first learn about or get exposed to sketch noting? So, you know, as a note taker in high school, middle school, college, you take notes by hand. At least I did. I'm old enough to, that was our primary means of taking notes in a notebook with, you know, some type of writing instrument. Um, but I was always a doodler. My mom was always a doodler. She would doodle while she was on the phone. So it's something that I watched and tried to emulate. Um, I don't know. Older listeners might remember the turtle at the back of magazines that you would try to draw and like send in for like like grant money or whatever. I don't remember. It, she was always drawing that same turtle. And um, I just remember like liking drawing when I was little. I'm, n- I'm in no way, shape or form any type of art student, art major, um, I took some design classes in high school, um, but that's really the extent of it. Um, But sketchnoting, you know, the way we see it now really came to me through Sylvia Duckworth. I saw a lot of her sketchnotes, and like you said, they're visually appealing. They draw the eye. You know, you can put the same information um, in text in an article, in a blog post, or you can put it in a sketch note, and I would say probably nine times out of ten, most people will gravitate towards the sketch note first, and then maybe look for more information on the topic. And and so she was my introduction to sketch noting in education and getting those big ideas on paper or, like I said, digitally, but you know through writing and through drawing and and making it a visual display that shares information. And then from there, you know, I explored the idea more and discovered that Mike Rohde is, is the guru. He's the guru. He wrote the book. He wrote the Sketchnote Handbook and the Sketchnote Workbook. And I've read both of those books. In fact, I'm in the middle. Is of that the, the book you have right here? Yeah. I, right now I have the Sketchnote Workbook, which I'm actually still in progress of reading. I'm in the middle of like five or six books right now. Um, don't ask. Um, <laughs> so, I, you know, I'm just getting great ideas and he talks about, you know, it's it's not um, it's ideas, not art. So while some people are masterful artists and do really great things with their images, sketch notes can be just a really great way to lay out words and focus on fewer images. But it's it's whatever works for you. So Mike Rohde has some really great stuff. He even has a podcast called Sketch Note Army. So I know we talk about podcasts all the time. That would be a great recommendation for you to check out and just listen to people who are in the process of doing it. And I love the way he closes the podcast every week. Um, although it's been, I haven't heard anything since June or maybe the beginning of July um, is, you know, three tips for the novice or newbie sketch noter. And, you know, a lot of it is just practice, practice, practice. Um, then I moved to Sunny Brown. I'm still reading her book too, but um, that was really great. And then my all time favorite book about sketch noting for teachers is Wendy Pillar's book, um, visual note taking for educators. And the reason I like that the best is as an educator, it's chock full of ideas of how you're going to use sketch noting in the classroom. And, you know, coming from that elementary background, especially first grade where writing in writing workshop is a lot of imagery and it starts with kids sketching their ideas. And if then if they're able to write words, then they do that. This is, this is just a natural extension of that. I was already doing it. I just didn't have a name for it. So, you know, five years ago when I was teaching first grade, six years ago, and even when I was teaching third grade prior to that, 
artwork was part of the writing process. It's not necessarily note taking, but it's what they're doing. And if you want to think about natural ways to fit that in, think about writing workshop in an elementary classroom. That's it, right? The way we take notes when we do um, nonfiction work in reading and writing workshop, that's visual note taking. I mean, even for Miles, as, as a this, this past year, as a three and four year old pre K student, a lot of what he would come home with at the end of the week was drawings, and you know the teacher would write the words, but he was expressing himself through pictures, right, and telling the story, and that's what sketch noting is. And you know, I also have preschool experience. Um, that. That's it. I mean, kids are in, kids are able to tell their story. And it's the same way with a sketch note or a visual note taking. You know, the note is primarily for the person who is taking the notes, unless they're hired out and, you know, they're a graphic facilitator. Then that's a little bit different. But um, because then you're you're capturing ideas for your audience. Well, then, so would you say that through your project? Mm hmm. The notes mean more to you than they would to somebody who just maybe stumbles across them on Instagram or Twitter? Absolutely. Right. So, and that's the point. So, in the classroom, sketch noting is for the student. And, you know, your sketch note on a teacher's lecture or on some piece of information will be completely different than my sketch note. But as long as you and I have the information and we're able to do, work with that information or share the key points of what we learned with the teacher. That's the basic, that's the baseline, right? Does that sketch note make meaning for you as the student so that it becomes a study tool or it becomes something to help you remember what you learned? Um, it's not about, you know, Great artwork. I mean, even Wendy Pillar says it's process over pretty. It's the process of retaining the information more than it is about having beautiful artwork. So you'll see sketch notes that, you know, might not be as visually appealing, but if they mean a lot to the sketch noter, then it doesn't matter. Now, with it being important to the learner and all about the person who's taking the notes, and this is very tough, I think, here in an audio podcast. Can you talk about some of the basic concepts on how somebody can get started? And, and, and just as a point of reference for, for, for the listeners, I will in the show notes link to a presentation that Stacy did that I captured on Periscope that you can actually see some of what I believe she's going to talk about actually in action. But can you share a little bit about how somebody gets started? Yeah, so um, for me, it's about you know, basic elements. I mean, you look at Mike Rohde's work and it, he calls it five basic elements, a circle, square, triangle, line, and dot. Um, I believe Wendy Pillars and a couple of other people add other shapes. So like a heart or um, an oval or a star. And you go from there and, you know, looking out the window right now, you can see a house. You know, what do you use to make a house? You use, you know, a parallelogram sophisticated math square language. rectangle <laughs> <laughs> right but that's it you're you know you're drawing a trying a triangular roof and maybe the peak the side of the house the triangular roof and a rectangular house and square windows all things that i'm sure anyone remembers drawing when they would draw a house you're not looking for an architect's sketch of a house as long as you can show me it's a house then we're good. Um, you know, if we're talking about time periods or certain areas and we talk about Pueblos and the house is going to look a little different, but it's not about, you know, drawing life, lifelike art or photographs. That's not what you're going for. So it's not the Renaissance. No, no. My <laughs> sketches are basic. Most sketch notes are pretty basic. Um, you know, and, and honestly, the biggest tip is to create an icon library for your content area and to have your kids create icon libraries and to even spend, you know, first three minutes as they're coming in, especially middle school, right? Because they come in at their own, on their own, on their own time. Um, you know, those three minutes while they're settling in, maybe they spend, you know, some of that time drawing whatever 
content that you want? The, like, what does justice look like? Some of it's just really open ended. Like, how do you how do you draw justice? I don't know. Like, I would look at a, an image of like scales, and that would be my justice. Maybe a gavel, and it's it's up to the individual. And that's what's really cool about sketch notes. It is so individualized. Right, and, and you mentioned the term icon library, which is building up. Is it the things that you would like if I want to draw and I'm just going to pull something out of the book that I'm, that I see here, if I was going to draw a cup of coffee, I would always draw a cup of coffee the same way. So I'm trying to perfect how I draw certain things that I'll do repetitively. Yes. So for me, like part of my icon library is like when I was, when I was sketching my hundred day project, a lot of it was my source. So I became really good at the Ted talk logo. Um, I needed to f- really hone in my skills of the Twitter bird because I was going to say the Twitter bird is your other big icon. <laughs> it's really hard to draw. It's, f- and, but then it became easier. And one of the um, sketch noters, um, Eva Lotta Lamb, in Mike Rohde's first book says uh, her biggest tip is to draw something fifty times, and then it becomes part of your muscle memory. And so I actually have a little notebook, which I didn't bring with me, um, a field notes notebook that is just all of my sketches. So whether it be a light bulb that I just sit there and practice and you do it different ways to see what's visually appealing to you, what takes the least amount of effort. Because if you're actually, as an adult, sketch noting, say, during um, a conference or during a faculty meeting, you don't want to get caught up in the, how exactly do I draw this thing? You want to have that with some type of automaticity so that it just comes naturally or other, um, other tips would be to like leave that space blank and come back to it later. But if you're working with kids, you want them to have a little bit more time than you would give yourself perhaps. And, um, and to, and time to practice for sure. Right. So we talked about shapes. Um, other things include the typography, you know, what are you doing with the letters on the page? Um, you know, you want to make sure that your handwriting is neat. And while the notes are for you, if you can't read your own handwriting, then you're really in trouble. Um, I try to do something really cool with the heading, although I lacked a lot of inspiration in that field when I was doing my 100-day project. I think sometimes because, as you pointed out, I was always doing it late at night, and it was almost like, a oh, I have to do this before I go to bed or I'm going to miss today. And I was already, you know, 50 days in, and that would be a big drag. But um, so you want to focus on, you know, your your drawing type and finding something that's quick and easy, but maybe stands out a little bit than your normal print or your normal cursive. Um, You want to think about your format. You know, um, I love looking at people's radial type things where, you know, you have that center idea and, you know, just as a side note, if you think about like these layout options, um, that Mike Rohde puts in his book or that other people talk about. A lot of it is just what we do with graphic organizers, right? When we do um, a mind map or when we do a web, you have that central topic and then all your radial spokes with those topics. And then if you're going deeper, then they get bigger, right? A more linear format of that would be a traditional outline where you have your topic and maybe your thesis and then you have you know, Roman numeral one with letter A, B, C, because if you have A, you have to have B. And, um, and then if you have a little one under that, then, you know, you have to have a two. So what I like about it though, is that there are no rules to it. So my point is I really like radial, um, like those web type of sketch notes. I'm not really good at making them. So what are some of the other types of flows that you could have? I'm a more linear person. So I, you know, if I'm doing a two page sketch note, then I go down the left side and I go down the right side. So I start at the top, work my way down, go to the right side of the page. And, um, so as if, as if you were writing, you follow that same flow. Yeah. Um, for me, I, and this has always been my habit, the important things or my big takeaways, I tend to put in the margin because my eye goes towards the margin a lot more. So if you look at some of my sketch notes, you'll see that, you know, things happen, the more important things are in margins, or I might get crazy and I'll just put some type of container around it, whether it be like a cloud or a frame. And that's another element of sketch noting, right? Is those containers and, you know, boxes and, but then those are all elements that we teach our kids, right? You know, 
other elements of sketch noting would include bullets and dividers and connectors. And, you know, how do we connect something that, you know, if you're a linear note taker that you started on the left hand side of the page as you're listening to someone speak and then somehow they bring it back at the end. Right. Because that's a good speech. You start with one idea and you wrap it up with the same type of um, with the same message at the end. Well, then maybe I'm drawing this arrow meandering, getting to that last end point and how they connect. Um, you know, a lot, a, a lot of the work too is going back and looking to see connections. You know, as a student, if I'm taking notes um, on anything in a history class, I'm going to look for those connections. Like how does this piece of history or what happened during this time period in this one place connect to something in a different place but the same time period or how does this time period connect to this much later time period what is the connection it can be sifted out and you can get that information if you take time to remove yourself it's like it's like anything else that we do like a writing project you know once you remove yourself a little bit you can put the pieces back together with a little more clarity and there are different methods to sketch noting um i try to do live sketch noting you know, I do it when I like, you know, when we go to ed tech conferences or tomorrow, I'll be sketch noting um, at Teach Me. So that for me is a live endeavor. Most of my 100 day project, though, was done with YouTube, which has that pseudo live feel because you're listening to it live and you're trying to get the information live. But you've got this really great cheat called the pause button and you can pause and rewind and go back to anything that you might have missed. And I'll be honest with you, when I did do the YouTube videos as part of my 100-day project, a lot of times I would vet them first. So if they weren't interesting, the first listen to, I went and looked for something else. So a lot of times I was tired at night. You know, I'd listen to a 20-minute speech and then think, oh, and I don't know. And I'm a completionist. I had to listen to the whole thing. You know, like it wasn't like oh, five minutes in. I can't listen to this. Very, very rarely do I abandon things like that. So, I mean, those are really the bigger elements of, of sketch notes. You have your titles, your icons, the typography, your handwritten notes, your dividers, arrows, and your images, containers. I really like making um, thought and speech bubbles when someone and when I'm quoting someone as best I can if I'm doing it live right but um or I'll just even just put quotation marks around it but I'll like overemphasize the quotation marks so that I know like hey draw your eye here this is something that this person said and it was so meaningful that I had that I wanted to capture it as a quote instead of just a general idea and that's part of sketching too is just you know synthesizing the information and pulling out the most meaningful parts so really your sketching is I just wish that this was something that I was taught as a kid, that this existed in a real format um, and a legitimate way to teach note taking when I was a student, because it teaches so many different skills that are so vital to students as they become more independent learners. And even as they're learning how to become independent learners and what learning means, um, which is a valuable tool. I, I agree that it's valuable and I myself am, am by no means an artist, and you, you say you're not, but again, your, your sketch notes are gorgeous. <laughs> Thank you. When, you. when you talk about this as something that students should, be, should do, I don't think you mean, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not going to put words in your mouth, it's not for every student, every class, every period. This wouldn't be something that every child should shift to. That There's a time and a place but do you think it's applicable to all subject areas? Um, I don't think it's compulsory, right? So if you're a traditional note taker who likes to get every word down, then great, that's you. Um, but I don't think that it should be shunned, that if a kid likes to draw a picture in the margins to help make meaning, or even if they're doodling in the margins um, and it looks like they're not paying attention. I always had those kids, right? Those kids who would like, playing with their shoes completely turned around in the meeting area, not facing me. But if I asked them a question, they knew the answer, right? I didn't worry so much about them because I totally got that they got it. So if you have a kid who's doodling, as long as they can make meaning of what they're learning at the time, then I don't see a problem with it. I think that's really um, the shift that I would like to see, that we're not shunning 
different ways of taking notes that it doesn't have to be done on a computer because guess what? You have a, a a Chromebook in your classroom and you're one-to-one. That doesn't mean that we throw away all pen and paper. You know, you joked with me, you said, did you bring a computer today? And I said, no, I brought paper (laughs) and I have my phone because I don't leave home without it. But no, that's, this is my technology today is my phone and my traditional technology is the, you know, the four notebooks that I have here and two books about sketch noting. Actually, I have five notebooks. Well, the way you just spoke about sketch noting, that's really applicable to bigger picture learning and education. Yeah. You know? And so I'm sorry to interrupt you, but your other question was, um, does it fit in all content area? And I think, yes, yes, it does. You know, I look back at my high school experience and college experience in math, especially, and math for me was just a beast until we got to geometry where it was all drawing and it was pictures and it was shapes and it was a lot of words, right? Because you had to memorize all those theorems and theories and postulates and- You memorized them? (laughs) We had to, Okay, right? Like, And it was was like language arts meets math and it was so great. Um, I excelled in geometry and not so much in all the others. (laughs) And- and, and like, for me, that's drawing, right? Like you have to draw those angles. That's like, it would make sense to draw on that. And, you know, maybe you're not drawing a whole lot in math, um, but maybe you are, maybe your brain is thinking of those mathematical equations in a way that my brain isn't. And then you're able to make meaning through images by all means do it. But again, it has to, it has to be meaningful and it can't just be for fun. It can be fun, but it can't just be for fun. It's not like, oh, boys and girls, today we're going to do this thing because it's fun. You know, it's like... They can can find fun in it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they Um, should. All right, Stacey, let's recap this a little bit. Uh, If if you can just share again the the books that you would recommend for people who are interested in learning more about sketchnoting, in addition to all the information you provided, which somebody else taught you. So, So what are these books again? All right. So before you even drop any money down on a book, I would say start with Sylvia Duckworth's presentation on sketchnoting, which is actually the one that I used when I talked about sketchnoting at EdCamp Leader um, because I couldn't find my presentation in my Google Drive. I threw it in the trash. Um, And then I was able to retrieve it when I got home. You know, once all the stress and pressure that Billy Cracker put on me (laughs) was over. But start with her presentation. So hers is... um, Which we will conveniently put in the show notes for this episode. Yeah, but you can find it on her Twitter, on her her website. But yeah, I would start there. And if you like what you see, then my next recommendation is twofold. So if it's for you and your own practice as a sketchnoter and for you to maybe make your own ideas about how to use it in education, then I would definitely go with Mike Rohde's The Sketch Note Handbook. It's black. Um, it's a black cover, so it's not the orange-covered one. It's the black-covered one. And it's a really great element, the elements of sketch noting. It's, it's the basics. Um, if you're looking for something that has a more educational slant and maybe your district is paying for it, but they want to have justification for laying out, you know, 20 ish bucks, then I would say go with Wendy Pillar's visual note taking for educators. And in there you will find so many different ways to, um, use sketch noting in your classroom with little kids, big kids, high school kids, English language learners, you know, in all different content areas in all different ways. That book was really chock full of educational application as well as solid research. And um, you can learn a lot from that book. So either of those would be my first go-tos. But start with Sylvia's free presentation that's available online. If you who are listening, if you are a sketch noter, Stacey and I would love to see things that you've sketch noted. So snap a photograph, get a screenshot, post it on Twitter. And tag us. Tag us. She is at IRunTech on Twitter. Use the hashtag House of Ed Tech so I see it. Tag me in the tweet. And that'll be cool. We, we, I know Stacey would love to see it. I know I would love to see what you're sketchnoting. Or if by listening to this conversation, you're compelled to try sketchnoting, share your work. We would love to see it. I love seeing the, peop- the work that people do. So please share. Oh, wait. And real quick, where can, what's the easiest way that people can see your 100-day project? Or is that something I can just link to? 
Um, I guess the easiest way to see it would be Instagram, just because there's no other fluff on there beyond what's in my notebook. There's there are a few random pictures. Um, okay, so we, we we can link to your Instagram in yep. the notes. I'm at I run tech on Instagram as well. Awesome, because she runs it all. <laughs> <laughs> And now it's time for the House of EdTech VIP. And Stacy, you decided this episode's VIP. So go ahead, take it away a little bit. All right. Today's VIP is Sean Farnham. He is at Magic Pants Jones best, on Twitter. Best Twitter name, Sean, at Magic Pants Jones. I love it. I will never forget that. Um, he is, I believe, a third grade teacher down in Florida where he is probably setting up for his classroom. He is also the creator of the number two pencil chat, which is brilliant because you get to use that hashtag in its old form, the number sign. Um, So number two pencil chat is really, there's a focus on going back a little old school and not using all those digital tools that we find so enticing like candy and going back to, you know, eating some of your vegetables and what is it like to use some of the older things that they're the things that we, you know, we've had in our classrooms forever. And, um, they meet every Tuesday night at 7 PM topics have ranged from, you know, the cardboard project, which there's a really great, um, the cardboard arcade. I forget whose arcade it was. My I'm apologies. not familiar. I'm going to have to Google this. We <laughs> talked about that a long time ago. This little boy, um, makes an arcade Kane's arcade. He makes an arcade out of cardboard. So that was one of our conversations. Like, what would you do if you had unlimited cardboard in your classroom? Like, how would you let your kids create? And it's all about being a creator. And that to me is really important. You know, we can create in so many different ways and methods using so many different materials, whether it be digital or fabric or, you know, I'm in the house of ed tech where there's a lot of new wood and paint and um, veneer and stains and stuff and you know how do we create and how do we let our kids use their hands beyond on a keyboard or you know sliding it across a tablet um and that's really sean's motivation is getting back to some of that old school stuff we've talked about markers and sharpies and pens and we've even had a heated debate on whether or not spiral notebooks should be allowed to exist um I think they should if they have the nice perforated edges and you can teach people how to tear out the pages neatly. We're going to have our first fight. I don't believe in spiral <laughs> notebooks at all. <laughs> but um, no, I actually have a spiral notebook here. Look, there's a spiral in there. Look at that. Um, yeah, so the topics are really just funny and random. And and is that 7 p.m. Eastern? Yes, Florida. Mm-hmm. Okay, Florida time. And also, Sean is the co-founder of EdCamp St. Augustine. I didn't know that. That's, well, I'm looking at his Twitter profile. Again, Magic Pants Jones on Twitter. So, Sean Farnham, congratulations. Uh, if you're not connected with Sean, again, go find him on Twitter, at Magic Pants Jones. And he is the House of Ed Tech VIP. And Stacy, that's going to do it for this episode, number 68 of the House of Ed Tech podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Chris. This was fantastic. It's really nice to see your space, see the lamp, the light that you um, that you were able to create. I love that thing. <laughs> and uh, just get like a behind the scenes view of what it's like to be in the House of Ed Tech. This is beautiful. You've done a really great job in here. And, and I have to, one, thank you so much for your compliments. And you're on a very short list of people who really almost at the drop of a hat could come and be inside the House of Ed Tech and be on the show. Summer, no obligations. Life is good. <laughs> so, so the challenge would be when I say, hey, it's almost Christmas. You want to come back? <laughs> that would be challenging. Christmas shopping and... We got some nice malls out here, but... <laughs> sure. um, so real quick, I also need to say thank you again to this episode's sponsor, and that's SummerPD.com. Again, if you go to summerpd.com, use the promo code House of Ed Tech, all smushed together, 
and you can save yourself $10 on all 10 courses that are available to you over at summerpd.com. Definitely keep the conversation going. Stacy shared so much information about sketchnoting and transition, and she threw out a whole bunch of resources. And you can access those resources over on the website, chrisnessy.com slash 68. And we're going to have all the links and the videos and everything that Stacy shared. So thank you again for sharing so much, Stacy. Thanks for having me, Chris. I really appreciate it. <laughs> um, I would love to connect with you who are listening. I want to hear your thoughts on the information. Just go to the website, click share feedback, and that's going to give you my email and all the ways to connect with me. The fastest of which is Twitter. I'm Mr. Nessie on Twitter. Use the hashtag House of Ed Tech. And Stacey, how can people connect with you? I'm also on Twitter. You can look for me at I Run Tech. I have my Instagram feed, which is also at I Run Tech. And I have a website that I haven't published to since the end of the school year, which is irontech.me. So connect with Stacy and prompt her to do more blogging and posting on her website. Also, if you enjoyed the podcast and if you got this far, you, you must. So number one, tell somebody. Word of mouth is the best way to share great podcasts you love. Number two, rate and review the show on iTunes. An honest review and a rating is going to help and keep the show front and center for others to enjoy. On the next episode, episode 69, I'm going to be speaking with Phys Ed teacher extraordinaire Justin Schleider and we're going to be talking about technology and phys ed. Until next time, thanks for joining me and Stacy. and remember Using technology isn't difficult, just give it a try The House of Ed Tech is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. The Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators. Podcasts by educators. For more, go to edupodcastnetwork.com.